So um, I don't have a gavel, so I can't make everybody be quiet. But um, anyway, thank you all for being here today for this uh, special event for Judge Norman. Um, and there are a lot of people to thank, and I certainly can't thank everybody. But I would like to um, name some people uh, before I hand the uh, mic off to Rich McGee, who's going to MC our... Um, presentation here in our event and tribute to Judge Norman. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, thank and acknowledge all the help and support from my wife, Tiffany. Um, and today we have so many other people. Mary Babilov, who did such a great job with Melissa Webb on doing the program, which each of you will be able to have when you leave. It has a, a close-up picture of the uh, portrait and we didn't want to hand that out before the unveiling and so you if you want you'll get one of those when you walk out and we'll have some uh, refreshments um, for everyone when you leave um, Jerry Thomas and fake Thomas Jerry Thomas has done so much over the past month or so getting this together and coordinated and I can't thank her enough for all the work she's done um, she is a an incredible organizer um, and she's done a great job uh, and of course her husband fate and helping also has been Lauren McLean and uh, I want to thank Judge Smith and and her staff in uh, Division 4 for the great uh, support and allowing us to have her courtroom today it is now hers so thank you Judge Smith and she is also going to be speaking today um, Dana George, of course, in her staff, I can't say enough. Uh, Jay Norman and the lawyers who practiced and practice at the uh, Norman Law Offices and uh, their support. Jessica Penrod Kirby, um, Tracy Palabiki, who works with me, and she's done a fantastic job. Um, and we have Michael Gomez, who is... Uh, our photographer today. And um, I also want to thank uh, Justice Koch, uh, or maybe more appropriately called Justice Dean Koch, not to take any of his titles away, uh, for uh, being here today. And the, the great support from the Nashville School of Law, of which um, Judge uh, Norman is an alumnus. And so I want to thank these people. And there's so many others, and I, I apologize, but we've we're going to try to keep this brief so that uh, people don't sleep and um, you can get back to your lives. Um, but anyway, but I want to really thank uh, Igor Babilov for his work, his creation here. Um, and it's a fantastic piece of art and it's, it's really a treasure. And you'll see some of the work that that Igor has done in the past and his background. And um, it can only be described as, as a masterpiece. It's a world-class piece of art that's going to be in this courtroom um, for a long time. Um, and that's very fitting that such a fine piece of art has been created uh, by Igor uh, for Judge Norman and to celebrate what he's done and to pay tribute to what he's done for this community. Um, his legacy will live on in this. And I think it's also fitting that his portrait be placed to my right, uh, looking across the courtroom at a legendary lawyer uh, in this city, his father, Jack Norman Sr. And um, I, I think that's kind of special that that has turned out to be, of course, he's got a large portrait, his father's smaller, <laughs> and um, he's a little bit higher. I'm not sure what this means, but he's looking down on his father, and um, I, I think that's nice. And I want to take this opportunity to say that as this is a, a legacy piece of art that celebrates Judge Norman, it fits in line with a long line of attorneys and judges who have practiced in this county. Um, going back to 
the earliest, the first court session in this county, not in this building, in 1788, Andrew Jackson. From there, you had Sam Houston. You had a long line of pioneers and trailblazers. And um, you had John McNary, who was one of the first judges who, uh, I think it was in 1793, in the first Nashville horse thief case, he sentenced the defendant who was named John McCain, not spelled like the former Senator John McCain, uh, sentenced him to an hour in the blockade, or the stockade rather, and whipped 39 lashes, two ear, both of his ears cut off, and he was branded with an H and a T on each cheek uh, for horse thief. And um, he then sent us a lady who had stolen some soap to nine lashes only. Uh, her, she was stripped down to her skirt and whipped nine times. Now, the reason I say these things is to kind of fast forward, and that is to say Judge Norman is a pioneer because he stopped that. <laughs> Judge Norman has recognized and been a pioneer in, in seeing the juncture between and the, what the real purpose of our criminal justice system is, to see the, the need for punishment, but also the need for rehabilitation. And that is where he has been a true pioneer, not just in our county, but also nationally. Um, you'll hear a letter, he couldn't be here, but the former, one of the former assistant czar, drug czars, um, not a Russian thing, an, um, uh, an American uh, drug czar who uh, helped take this nationally, uh, what Judge Norman created here and built here. And so as one of the pioneers of this long, rich history, in Tennessee of uh, lawyers and judges and people who have done great works in Davidson County. Um, I, I just want to point out that um, this is a tribute to him. We're not going to have Scott Burns here. His, he's, he's written a statement that will be read uh, for everybody. Um, so at this point, I would like to hand the mic off to Rich McGee who will MC this program. Um, and I'd like to say, Rich, uh, he's, not a, he's not a young lawyer. <laughs> um, and he's been practicing, I think now, would you tell me, 41 years? He's one of the stalwarts of the criminal defense bar, and I think it's appropriate, having uh, practiced in this field and done a great job in our community, that he can, uh, you know, MC this program and the unveiling for uh, Judge Norman and the tribute that we're here to celebrate the works that Judge Norman and the many people in this community who Judge Norman, through his foresight as a, as a legal pioneer, really, um, has done. And so thank you, Judge Norman. Judge, I'm truly honored to be here, and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, before we start uh, with the actual talks and presentations, uh, Father Strobel is here, and he's going to say a uh, quick prayer for all of us. Thank you, Rich and Judge Norman. It's an honor to be here. Um, it reminds me, there's a story of the alcoholic priest who began every one of his sermons. I'm an alcoholic. Now, what's your quirk? <laughs> what's your quirk? We're here today to honor and celebrate the life and legacy of Judge Seth Norman, who probably understands more than anyone in this room that we all have quirks and that despite our quirks, we're more alike than we are different. So in that spirit, let us pray. Good and gracious God, we call you by many names, but know you to be love eternal. 
Today, as we unveil the portrait of Judge Seth Norman, we celebrate the many things that bring us together rather than separate us. We recognize that together we are able to accomplish more than we can do individually. And we realize that by serving others, we better learn and appreciate the full depths of your eternal love. It is in this spirit of eternal love that justice is done within these walls. Justice not of vengeance, but a justice of forgiveness, a justice of compassion, a justice of understanding, of honesty and love between your children, brothers and sisters all. And so, oh God, help us to remember this, that we are all fragile creatures with our own quirks, delicate, easily broken beings who rely on one another for strength, stability, and a shoulder, a hand, a kind word, a moment of charity that helps us through difficult times, qualities that we all see in the life of Judge Norman. Help us, O oh God, to remember that we need communion with each other to stir, st st sturdy us against the rising tides of despair and hopelessness that follow the storms of addiction. And finally, O oh God, may this portrait of Judge Norman always be a reminder of his leadership in the search for justice and mercy in flowing that from the great gift of your eternal love. Amen. trouble. As Klein said, thank you. On behalf of Judge Norman and his family, I know every one of them is very, very appreciative that you all would take the time uh, to be here on a really, really special day. Uh, I've never been the MC for one of these, and I've seen some really good ones. I've seen some really bad ones. Right, Hal? Um, and... Uh, <laughs> The, uh, and I think I'm supposed to say, and thanks all the judges who were here and the district attorneys and the luminaries and the executives and the old friends and the new friends. We're all in this together, folks. So it's just a big giant thank you all for coming. A little bit of stats about the good Judge Norman. Uh, he served in the Korean War. United States Air Force. He was on an airplane that lost an engine coming out of Guam, and they decided that they would try to avoid the ocean, or he might not be here today. Following his service in the United States Air Force and, and the war, he was in the General Assembly for two years. And I don't know if he knew at that point that that experience was going to pay dividends many, many years later. Because one thing Judge Norman learned was how to get something done in the legislature. And we'll be coming back to that. He then practiced law for 28 years. And I used to remind him every now and then, said, Judge, you know what it's like to be, to be out there practicing law. You're late, Mr. McGee. I know I'm late, Judge, but I haven't been eating bonbons and getting my nails done. I've been in three other courts. He knew, 28 years, 28 years in the trenches. Judge Norman, like all the Normans, were people lawyers. And that helped him when he became a judge, because judge knows what it's like to represent people, not corporations. He knows what it's like to be dealing with people who are doing the best they can on a daily basis. Oftentimes, some people would say not very well, but they were still doing the best. And after all those years, being there, he became a judge. And I had the uh, uh, honor of practicing in front of him for a long, long time, as long as he was on the bench. And there were a few times I think I aggravated him. <laughs> and there might have been a few times where I talked a little bit too long. The judge was always patient with me, but after a while, when he would lean back in the chair and the eyes would roll back, as a young lawyer, I realized it was time to 
And of course, during this, this period of time uh, is that time where the drug court came into effect. And I can remember having a conversation early on when the drug court idea was swirling through that crafty brain of yours. And you, the judge asked me, he said, you know, what, what about tactile? Tennessee Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, can I get him on board? And I said, well, it's best. I said, of course, judge, we think it's a wonderful idea. And he proceeded to tell me how he was going to put together the drug court. And he was going to go to the legislature and he was going to get buildings and property and money. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, good luck. <laughs> You're going to be going to the legislature on behalf of criminals, drug addicts, and a whole lot of poor folk, and they don't have a constituency that votes. But I also knew one thing. I knew if there was any one person who could pull it off, it was him. And over the years, I'd pop my head in his office, and it was either, we, this is happening, and we got this, and we got this, and it's really looking great. And other times, it would be, they promised me this and I ain't getting it. And and I told them they could go, we could I'll take that building and we can do this and we can do that. But it didn't matter. The times when the doors were being shut in his face, and truth be told, a lot of folks shut doors in his face. And a lot of times when people said, Oh yeah, I got you, I got you, I got you, but when it came to writing the check, uh, that didn't always happen. This man never lost faith. And he didn't lose faith because of the reason behind his efforts to start the drug court. And Judge, two words that I really feel describe you, and I've had an opportunity to sneak behind the screen and, and I've seen the photograph, or the, the portrait rather, sorry. Um, compassion. I looked the, the word up today, compassion sympathetic, but more importantly, concern for the sufferings or misfortunes of others. Empathy, the ability to understand and share the feelings of others. What's that great uh, line from a Supreme Court case? I can't describe it when I know, I know it when I see it. Well, when you think of the words compassion and you think of the words of empathy, you think Seth Norman. And for those bleak times, those hard times to get the drug court from an idea to the reality that it's become, I'm convinced that it was that compassion and empathy that I'm sure that gentleman on the lower side of the wall had a whole lot to do with instilling in this gentleman. <coughs> so where are we? Well, the portrait. The portrait was created by this maestro, and a maestro he is. And you're going to get to see it shortly. But when you do, I want you to think about those two words, compassion and empathy, because it's in the portrait. You can see it, you can feel it, because the portrait is of you. Years from now, there will be young lawyers, when we're all gone, who are going to walk in and are going to point at that and they're going to say, who was that guy? It's the reality of it. And for those of us who are still around and they ask that question, I know what I'm going to say. I'm going to say, that's the godfather of the drug court. But not only in Tennessee. Oh, no. But it, in the United States of America, because let's not kid ourselves. This pioneer, this pathfinder, is the person, international as well. I was told to use the word grandfather. Nah. Godfather. That's my word. <laughs> so the reason that we're here is to unveil the portrait. Well, let me tell you a little bit 
about the gentleman who's responsible for that. Maestro Igor Babov is a world-renowned American portrait painter. He's an honorary academic, academician of the Russian Academy of Arts, which was established in 1757. You guys remember that, 1757? <laughs> and one of the most sought after portrait artists of our times. He is deemed a living master by his contemporaries. He was selected to, pay, to paint legacy portraits of three living presidents of three countries, two living prime ministers, members of the noble families and British royalty, and three living popes for the Vatican. According to the maestro, I am a Russian by birth and an American by choice. His notary commissioned portrait subjects include President George Bush, which hangs in his presidential library, in the Clinton Presidential Library, a portrait of Hillary Clinton, Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito, Pope Francis, Pope Benedict, Pope John Paul II, his Royal Highness Prince Andrew, the Duke of York, Prime Minister of Canada, Prime Minister, two Prime Ministers from Canada, the Founder and CEO, Mr. Sharp of the Four Seasons Hotel and Resorts, the Governor of the Bank of England, Honorable Joseph Sullivan, Supreme Court of New York, and the list goes on and on. In 2009, a new portrait of George Washington was officially inducted into George Washington's Mount Vernon Museum, and U.S. General and CIA Director David Petraeus presented the artist with the award for excellence for the work on his official legacy portrait. In 2010, the Vatican curator acknowledged him as maestro for his Vatican portrait of Pope Benedict XVI, selected by the Pope himself to represent his papacy for the Vatican Slenders in Splendors International Museum Tour. He was honored to be the only living artist in the exhibition as his papal portrait hung alongside the work the works of Michelangelo, Romini, Giotto, and other great masters of the Renaissance. He was awarded an honorary doctorate by Columbia University in 2019, and in 2015, the Tennessee Senate and House of Representatives passed resolution number 69, quote, to recognize him and celebrate his artistic achievements. And the bill was signed into law by Governor Haslam, who many of you all know was one of the biggest supporters of the drug court program. He is considered and is a child prodigy. He began his formal, formal, formal classical art training at the age of nine. I was using crayons. He was studying with the leading, he said with leading masters of traditional painting and drawing in the span of 16 years. He attained the highest level of fine art education and received his master of fine arts degree, officially a PhD under the Russian Academy of Arts, which taught and gave the world many outstanding masters a portrait, including two gentlemen whose names I cannot pronounce, and James Whistler. His fine art education especially contributed to his unparalleled skill in academic drawing from his life, which today is a fundamental challenge for many painters. He's received more national and international awards that could be listed on the sheet. And this is really important because it he, we were talking and he said to me, you know, I try to step into the shoes and get to really feel the soul of the person whose portrait I've been asked to make. And he did that with you, Judge. He did that with you. And he's an advocate, the maestro is. He's an advocate for the timeless values in the academic tradition of painting. He's taught at the Florence Academy of Arts in Florence Academy of Art in Italy and lectures and demonstrates all over. But there's one last part that I really wanted to talk about. This is the man. And we got to give credit where credit is due. Klein, I don't know where you're hiding. He is, I agree, he is uh, very involved in supporting humanitarian causes, dealing with children, health, and wellness issues education for special needs, autism and Down syndrome, 
STEM research, veterans, military service organizations for returning veterans of war and those warriors suffering with PTSD and other related illnesses. Childhood disabilities, cancers, Alzheimer's, he works with orphanages, foster care, and disaster relief. That's the reason. That's the reason. He was the right person for you, Judge, because those causes are your causes. So at this point, it's my privilege, uh, humbly, to introduce to you all Maestro Igor Babak. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, it's uh, an honor and a great privilege to be here today to unveil the portrait of Judge Norman. And uh, uh, well, preacher, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, that's it's. I have not. I don't have much to add to that. But uh, in uh, uh, in visual art, they say it's uh, it's all um, it's about seeing. That's what, that's why it's called visual art. So I decided to uh, make a a quick presentation and to give an idea. Uh, who I am and what I do, and to show some samples of my works, I've done a little bit of my philosophy on uh, the art of portraiture. Uh, today, it's uh, quite often it's been confused with the photograph. When uh, you hear portrait, and people may think right away about the photograph, but there's a huge difference between both, between two. Um, the portrait really it goes. Uh, so far beyond photography. There's a little music in the background. I hope it's okay. <laughs> um, I've done uh, over 2,000 portraits in my lifetime, so uh, I'm not going to show you all of them today. Um, One of the important things uh, uh, in portraiture for portrait artists is to, uh, um, to understand the sitter, the subject. And that's what makes portrait different from a photograph, because uh, we portrait painters, we are trying to get to capture the inner world as much as we do with the outer likeness. And uh, in order to do that, the best way to, uh, to communicate with a person is through uh, a drawing. Uh, not painting, drawing. And the great masters, all the great masters in the past, they knew that. So they very often drew. Because when you, let's say when you paint, you can get away with mistake here and there. You can even miss something and it wouldn't be noticeable. With drawing, you capture everything. Because you made this black and white, so you made a mistake, and uh, it's, it will be noticeable right away. So uh, it's a challenge, but uh, uh, it's also for an artist. It's a, it's a great uh, tool for studying the the person, the personality. I love this quote uh, by Pietro Nigoni. Uh, he was a royal portrait painter. He said, painting cannot exist without drawing, and in every case, it is drawing from life that gives the exact measure of the painter. The drawing never fails, but often the artist does. Uh, so quite often today, uh, the artists, the um, uh, portrait artists, they try to, uh, well, uh, we have a photography today, so, it's so it makes it so easy, and quite often it's used as a shortcut. Uh, so they select the picture and then they copy it. But uh, it's not, it wouldn't, it, it's, uh, there is so much more to, uh, uh, to the person. You know, they, to, you know, to reach to that, the inner world, it's uh, what, I, uh, what I do, I uh, have to communicate with the person uh, through that art medium. 
it's, uh, it's not the same as, let's say, if you just talk to the person uh, or you have an image and you copy it. But to have, to, to have the alive person in front of you, that person moves, you can feel uh, any uh, movement of muscle even, like it depends on what, about what, what person thinking about, something sad or something happy, you can see it in their eyes. So uh, to, uh, the ability to capture that, that's what uh, really separates uh, the fine art of portraiture from everything else. And the great masters of the past, they always, always knew that. So it was the most challenging. That's why uh, a lot of artists, like even Rembrandt, who is who's known as a great portrait painter, at some point he just wanted to give up the portraiture. He wanted to paint landscapes because it was challenging. Uh, even uh, uh, the way uh, uh, we hold the pencil when we draw. It's something that is never taught today, unfortunately. And even a lot of artists don't know that. But this is actually the correct way. And all the great masters of the past, again, they held their pencils this way. So uh, for this reason, I make, this is part, a very important part of my portrait procedure to uh, sketch the people. Um, so this, they could be uh, a few uh, small, larger sketches, but to have that communication. So we can see here, there is a banker, there is prime minister, uh, the general, uh, the royalty, the doctor, Is uh, Pope Benedict? Is Judge Norman? It was one of our uh, uh, sittings in my studio. This was the uh, Justice Supreme Court Justice of uh, Wisconsin. This uh, had recently this sitting in preparation for the official portrait of uh, Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito had a great sitting at the National Arts Club. I quite often do master portrait demonstrations. And actually, in fact, this, uh, 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 this person sitting for me is also uh, a justice, of, uh, George Attul from Boston, Massachusetts, um, president of Vanderbilt University. Uh, that was a very quick, spontaneous uh, uh, demo I did at uh, one of private clubs in Washington, D.C. Sketch all the time, everywhere. Sketch myself too sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> that was a present uh, to myself on my birthday. I walked uh, by the mirror and uh, I looked at the guy in the mirror and said, it's been a while since I drew that guy. So I set up the mirror and uh, there was one source of light and, and uh, just did that sketch. And uh, of course, uh, the most challenging is to draw children. Because I call them moving targets because <laughs> they, they just they can't sit still. Uh, a little bit about the portrait it was a very interesting project when I did this, uh, created the portrait of uh, uh, George Washington for the Mount Jordan Museum. In uh, 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 my research, I learned that, well, obviously we all know that there were lots of portraits done of the first president. And uh, like there on top, you can see uh, two portraits by Gilbert Stewart, but all of them were, looked like, like portraits of different people almost. So, uh, and I learned that the most accurate likeness was created by uh, Jean-Antoine Audon, the sculpture you can see. So I decided to base my portrait on the sculpture. And uh, I basically turned the sculpture, kind of transformed the sculpture into a painting. And that was the official induction at uh, Mount Vernon Museum. With some commissioned portraits. 
this was a grand prize in the international portrait competition. Uh, the official portrait of Pope Benedict, which is in the Vatican. And uh, it was uh, um, at the Vatican Splendors exhibition, the see picture. Uh, it was literally on the same wall, like just around the corner from Michelangelo. It's like mind blown. It's like <laughs> I was thinking about this. The great honor, of course. President George W. Bush, the portrait uh, was commissioned on the occasion of the G8 summit. This is, was my second Pope, who is the saint now, Pope Saint John Paul II. Uh, first lady uh, at the time, Hillary Clinton. That was uh, paint, painted in 1996, but uh, did 1993 inauguration day. She was actually wearing that exactly that outfit. That's in Clinton Presidential Library. This is a portrait of my third pope, the current pope, uh, Pope Francis. It was featured on uh, uh, the billboard at Times Square. This is a justice uh, at the Supreme Court of New York, Joseph Sullivan. General David Petraeus. Uh, this is Wright Pinson the CEO of Vanderbilt Health System. Prime Minister of Canada, Maharuni. There's an interesting picture on the left. Uh, John Kerry is walking by my portrait in the parliament. The uh, Prince Andrew, the Duke of York, that's in Buckingham Palace. The president of Malta, uh, Mayor Rudy Giuliani was unveiled by Henry Kissinger. This was an interesting project I did uh, this past summer. Was the Vatican commissioned me the commander of the papal, uh, papal Swiss Guard? You can see that uh, very unusual uh, the armors. And, I went so many times through the gates, the Vatican gates, that the Swiss guards started to salute me. <laughs> the Harvard Medical School portrait. This is President uh, Vladimir Putin of Russia. The governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney. Nelson Mandela, it was a great experience. I literally had uh, four minutes to draw the sketch. Uh, so there's, I didn't have time to use the eraser. So you can see it's very, very rough, but you just, you, you, you capture what you need. It's like, it's also, it's one of those situations, take it or leave it. And so I said to myself, how often Nelson Mandela would sit for you? So I took it. A beautiful lady, this is uh, here in Nashville. Another beautiful lady in Washington, D.C. Ambassador Michael Novak. There is, uh, uh, he's with Margaret Thatcher receiving uh, his uh, Templeton Prize. Uh, founder of Four Seasons Hotels, uh, Isidore Sharp. Uh, a lady from Montreal, a private commission. Um, this portrait I just unveiled a few weeks ago, delivered it to Madrid, Spain. Uh, Frank Military was uh, uh, the music publisher for Frank Sinatra. The patriarch of Moscow in all Russia. Lori Henry, uh, Nashville, Tennessee. She was, uh, she was the wife of uh, Senator Henry. Mikhail Kalashnikov, inventor of AK-47. There is actually him sitting right next to Porchet. 
Byron Janis, who is an American, he is American, legendary pianist. And uh, there is his wife, uh, Maria, Maria Cooper Janis, the daughter of uh, actor Gary Cooper, with uh, Patricia Neal, the actress. Bob Costas. Tony LaBianca. Remember the French connection? Ted Lazenby is uh, from Nashville. Reggie Jackson, Mr. October. Regis Philbin. He actually unveiled it on his show at uh, the, uh, the Regis and Kelly show. He said, Kelly, you wouldn't believe what happened to me last night. <laughs> This is my beautiful wife, Mary. Actor James Gandolfini, remember the, the Sopranos series? Senator uh, from North Carolina. Dr. Kimura from Harvard University. This is my, my mom. Uh, the Kings, remember the 60s, the British invasion. Uh, he's uh, one of the founding members, and there he is with uh, Paul McCartney when they were young. Chief pilot to the King of Norway. Bobby Hall, the hockey player. Tom Monaghan, uh, the founder of Domino's Pizza. A newspaper publisher, Contrans Corporation, another corporate portrait. This is a double portrait. Children, I love to paint children. It's a totally different approach to, the, to painting all as adults. <clears throat> Beautiful children. This is my, my son in my book. This on the left when he was 11 days old, and on the right when he was uh, 19. Um, I paint large murals too. This is a, a big painting well, from my imagination. This particular uh, uh, painting was uh, half of these children are uh, the, in the family of uh, the Hunt brothers. Uh, Han Brothers Pizza. This painting is also a large painting, it's in my studio, and I uh, dedicated it to the millions of uh, the victims of Stalin's repressions. It's something that I'm working on too, right now. Very large piece. This is my studio here in Brentwood. Some awards. Nighthoods, a couple of nighthoods. Um, this was uh, I received from the Librarian of Congress, sent me the congratulatory letter when I received the honorary American Academician of the Russian Academy of Arts. That was General Petraeus, uh, Pope John Paul II. Uh, the Senate Joint, Joint Resolution Number 69. There are some publications here featuring me, and it's uh, one of my recent books, The Great Explosion Moments. And yes, believe it or not, it takes 450 years for oil paint to dry completely. <laughs> this is why you, you go to museums and you see all this old paintings and they're beautiful. They look like they paint, they were painted yesterday because they, some of them are still drying. That's why you can probably, one of the reasons you can call a painting a legacy portrait because it lasts. Thank you very much. I at this time, please unveil the
Justice Coke, would you care to say a few words? <clears throat> Thank you, Maestro. Well, good afternoon. This is the first time I've given an address with musical accompaniment, so I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll try to stay on the beat here. Uh, uh, I'm delighted to be asked to be here today on behalf of the Nashville School of Law community. Uh, when I was invited to, to say a few remarks, I first asked, what do you want me to talk about? And they said, Seth Norman. I said, I think I can do that. Secondly, about how long do you want me to talk? And they said, well, no more than 30 minutes. And I got to thinking about that. And I, I remember when I used to preside in another court, that I would tell lawyers at the beginning of the argument that, well, you've got 15 minutes, but don't think you have to take it all. So I'm going to heed my own advice, and I'm not going to take all the rope that I've been offered here today. And I think I can say without risk of serious disagreement here that during the past 90 years, the Norman family has produced some of the most outstanding lawyers and judges that Nashville, Tennessee, and the world has ever seen. And of course, it all began with the legendary Jack Norman Jr. And it's continued with his sons, Jack Norman uh, Sr., excuse me, Jack Norman Jr., Seth, his grandson, Jay Norman, and his great-grandson, Seth Norman. So I'm delighted to say that the Nashville School of Law played a small supporting role in preparing the Normans for this work. And while Mr. Norman Sr. was a graduate of Vanderbilt, uh, what I know as the dean of the National School of Law is that Seth and his older brother, Seth's son, Jay, his grandson, Seth, are all graduates of the National School of Law. And that if you look at their graduation dates, it spans a period of 60 years. So the National School of Law and the Normans have been linked together for a very long period of time. Now, I'd have to also say even though we're here honoring Seth today, that the National School of Law has one other connection with the Norman family, and that is that his, his sister Carolyn married John C. Toon, another distinguished graduate of our school in 1962, and the Nashville Bar Association's highest honor given to lawyers every year for public service is in John Toon's name. So this is a high-powered group of folks in this family. Now, my ability to comment on Judge Norman's academic performance while he was a student at the National School of Law is strictly limited by confidentiality statutes and rules. Uh, I can, however, make one comment, and this ba is based on public information, that his admission to our law school in 1958 was materially aided by a college transcript that itself was heavily influenced by two cases of Jack Daniels whiskey. <laughs> I'm going to say no more about that. Uh, you, you can ask the judge about that later. Uh, as, as we all know, uh, the judge practiced law for many years with his father, his brother, uh, and his sons. Uh, and in 1990, he uh, uh, ran for the new, newly created fourth division of the criminal court, and he won. And when he joined the court, he joined many of his colleagues who were also graduates of the Nashville School of Law. At one time, I think our school had the monopoly on the bench here in Davidson County. And using any customary measure of judicial success, we'd have to say that Judge Norman was a success on the bench. But Judge Norman's not a usual man, so I think there are some other measures of success we should use. And what we know is that Judge Norman, like many NSL graduates, have the traits of perseverity, uh, uh, tenacity and perseverance. And the accomplishment that's going to set him aside from all his judicial colleagues for many, many years is the creation of DC4 the Davidson County Drug Court. And what I know from watching him create that from afar is that he broke new ground when he created that court in 1995, and he simply willed that court into existence. 
No other person other than Seth Norman could have undertaken that feat. And how he did it, some of those stories don't need to be repeated. Uh, most of it was legal. Uh, uh, at one point, he even confessed that if there was any loose furniture in the courthouse out in the hallway, he would get it and would find it way out to the drug court. Uh, but that also went on in the Supreme Court building as well, Seth, so it's, it's perfectly fine. But despite the budgetary and bureaucratic headwinds, the drug court has grown and thrived, and it now sets the standard for drug courts in Tennessee, in the United States, and indeed around the world. Without Judge Norman's efforts, the lives of literally thousands of the court's graduates and their families would not have been changed for the better. So Judge Norman is his father's son. And many years ago, it was said about another Democrat that he saw wrong and tried to right it. We can say the same thing today about Judge Norman. Accordingly, Seth, on behalf of the Nashville School of Law family, may I say thank you and well done. Thank you, Justice Koch. As uh, has pointed out, uh, Scott Burns, who was the former deputy drug czar, had really hoped to be here today. He, he simply could not for some terrible scheduling issues that came up. But he sent a letter that he requested to be read to all of us. And Nancy Kemp Hooper is going to join us now, and she'll tell you a little bit about her story after she reads the letter from Mr. Burns. Nancy, who is not a professional speaker, <laughs> uh, Thank you. told me that she would do the best she could to not cry. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Judge, it's truly an honor to be here. I think Jerry and Jennifer are pretty much determined to get me over my fear of public speaking. Yeah, this is like the fifth or sixth time maybe, uh, but I am grateful for that among many things. Um, it is with sincere and deep regrets that I cannot be present for this special event and share. I can only offer my love, respect, and profound appreciation for a man that has literally changed hundreds if not thousands of lives and a man that, thank God, I'm blessed to call my friend. While at the White House, I was, I was assigned to find the best treatment facility or program in the United States in order to replicate it in every state and fund it appropriately with the drug czar budget, over 13 billion at the time. I took this initiative seriously and traveled to a number of states across our great country and ultimately found myself in Nashville, Tennessee, sitting across a desk from a guy named Seth Norman and I say guy because that was before I even knew that he was the Honorable Seth Norman, who not only had a full calendar in a criminal court, but had established a drug court. I never called him a guy again. I called him your honor, and I called him my friend, because what he was doing was sui generis, unique unto itself, and not consistent with the norms and treatment or the protocol of the other 3,000 drug courts across America. In fact, it clashed with what was then accepted as best practices. It was not because what he was doing was wrong. It was because it was different, unique. His program was not for first-time offenders. They were repeat offenders that had previously tried a more traditional model, often used by other drug courts or intensive supervision, and had not found success. It was long-term, and it was a recovery community. What Judge Norman did was take people that were no question about it headed to the penitentiary and headed there in many instances for eight, 10, sometimes even 20 plus year sentences. Some were thieves and burglars and some were high end drug traffickers or meth lab repeat offenders. The point being Judge Norman accepted people who in any other person's assessment or in any other state in America deserve to be locked up for a long time. But what Judge Norman knew was that deep down, he was looking into the eyes of a good person, a person whose real problem and the cause of all of it 
was that this person suffered from the disease of addiction, alcohol, methamphetamine, heroin, opioids, and that if they were deemed by his team to be appropriate for the program, could address their substance abuse problem and other related issues and get clean and sober, and they could work hard to earn back the trust of their families, and they could become contributing members of society in Tennessee or wherever life took them. And you know what? It worked. These hardened and in many instances career, career criminals got clean and they learned a trade and got a job and they learned life lessons and skills like how to shop at a grocery store and register your car and get insurance and all of the things that many of us take for granted. Judge Norman was tough, very tough, when he had to be. He locked people up at times for a period of reflection where they would sometimes be allowed to come back for another chance and some even had to wait their turn to come back. This was to help them prioritize their recovery. While this was not easy, he said it was sometimes necessary to save a life. I, rem I remember meeting graduates that said if he had not done this or that, I would have kept using and died. He knew that length of stay, sustained monitoring, structure, accountability changed lives. He was beyond kind and loving when he could be, which was the best part of all of it. I cannot tell you how many people, thousands and thousands, that will never know their mother or father is clean and productive and taking care of them because of one man, the Honorable Seth Norman. His unique approach and the staff who have helped change lives. I went back to the White House and rang the bell called Broken Arrow and shouted all hands on deck and proceeded to spell it all out. This is the program to replicate nationwide and here's how it works. The only thing that prevented additional projects and funding across America was there was only one Judge Norman. We cannot replicate the Honorable Seth Norman. Nobody is like him. Nobody will devote the time and sweat and tears, and nobody has the presence and skill and moxie. Nobody. While we cannot replicate the Honorable Seth Norman, it is my hope that time is spent with him, learning from his wisdom, the trials and errors he has experienced, all with one goal, to protect this special model and help carry the legacy of the work of a man who was given his life to help others into the future. So today I say a little prayer and I thanked my God for being able to meet this great man, to become a friend of this great man and to join so many, many people in saying, as simple as this sounds, Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you for reuniting families. Thank you for saving lives. Thank you for doing what nobody else could do. And God bless you, Scott Burns. Um, I am one of those many uh, hundreds and thousands of people that Mr. Burns was referring to. Um, I first met Judge Norman in this courtroom. And Judge, I'm gonna say I prefer this. This is working for me. <laughs> yeah, this is much better because I know I can leave freely. Um, yes, but um, when I met the judge, I had already been through multiple uh, treatment centers. Um, and I just kept on going back out. I had not uh, been able to maintain sobriety. And I had been, I think this was my fourth time in jail and I had no hope of staying sober, no hope of um, getting my license back to uh, practice and participate in the career I went to school for. I had no hope of having good relationships with my family. Um, I mean, I was, spiritually and morally uh, bankrupt. Um, and Judge, I, I think I've told you this before, when I met you here that day, I, for the first time in a long time, began to have hope because there was something about you that I just, I just knew in my heart that if I gave you a reason to help me, you know, if I did the right thing and sh through my actions showed you I wanted something different, I knew that you would help me. And you certainly have, um, that was, around seven years ago, March of 2013, and I've maintained sobriety ever since with a lot of help, uh, a lot of people in this room, um, and of course my higher power, Jesus Christ. Um, but 
today I have all those things in my life that I never thought I would have again. Uh, my license has been uh, reinstated and they actually, I say they, people trust me today. You know, I manage a team of seven other pharmacists and I certainly never thought that would happen. Um, it's just, uh, it's just truly, you know, a miracle. But a lot of things he talks about, you know, family, um, being a productive member of society, someone that people trust and, you know, look up to. I just want to thank you so much for that because today, most importantly, I actually love myself again. And I certainly did not when we first met. So thank you. First story is going to be a McGee story. He talked about me sitting there and rolling my eyes back. I had a transcript at one time where Mr. McGee said, Judge, if you'll just give me one more minute, and 35 minutes later, he's still talking. <laughs> so don't come talking to me, McGee, about how you liked it and Cora didn't like it. That's the way you are. That's <laughs> Talking about court, I look around this courtroom too, and you know, this is pretty fancy digs compared to where I started out. I was the first judge of Division Four of the Criminal Court for Davidson County, Tennessee, and when I was elected in uh, 1990, they had a judge, but they didn't have a courtroom. So I wound up in the basement of the municipal auditorium is where I held court, which was fine most of the time. But when the circus came to town and the elephants came tromping through, it was a little difficult to hold uh, court when the elephants were there. With regard to what uh, Dean Coke had to say, it wasn't two cases, it was one case, Dean. That's all it took. So I got out of the service and came back, and I found out that you could get uh, college credits for service schools that you had attended. I thought, that's a pretty good idea. So I went down to old Seward Air Force Base down at Smyrna and found an old master sergeant that gave college credits for service schools you attended. And I did find out that he had a likeness for Jack Daniel whiskey. <laughs> and I do have a hell of a transcript, you know. <laughs> Four hours for forestry because I went to the Air Force Survival School down there. <laughs> forestry really does you a lot of good when you're practicing law, let me tell you. I did, uh, I was fortunate enough to practice law for 28 years and I enjoyed every minute of it. There were hard times, there are always hard times. But then I was fortunate enough, I say in 1990, to be elected to the bench. And there's not another experience in the world, I, I don't think, like uh, sitting on the bench and seeing the trials and tribulations of people and doing what you can to help them. Some you can help, some you cannot help. What you've got to remember, people, uh, that after over 20, I don't know how many years, 20 or some odd years of running the drug court, I found out that most people who are addicted to drugs are really good people with a bad problem. That's all there is to it. Most of them. I've always used this analogy. All of you have gone around and all of you have heard People say to a child, what do you want to be when you grow up, young fella, young girl? And you know, you hear a nurse, doctor, I want to be a lawyer, I want to be a pilot or something like that. Have you ever heard one say, I want to be the biggest druggie on the block? No, you hadn't. I will say, don't want to be, but that's what happened. So you got to remember that those people are really good people. The other thing I want to point out to you, and the legislature has been very helpful along these lines. You cannot 
incarcerate your way out of addiction. That's just all there is to it. We can't build enough prisons to do that. You can build a treatment bed. You can build four treatment beds for what it costs to, to build one uh, penitentiary bed. And it just makes sense to me to put people that deserve it in treatment rather than placing them in the penitentiary and just locking them up. I always felt that way. I want you to understand that I do not believe in treatment in lieu of incarceration. I believe in treatment in conjunction with incarceration, and that way it works. I said enough. I didn't uh, mean to uh, take a long time. I do appreciate all of you coming here. I do appreciate the kind words. I don't deserve them that have been said. I appreciate the work uh, that uh, the maestro has done with regard to the painting. Uh, I think he cheated a little bit because I don't remember ever looking that good. Uh, I don't know how he did it, but he did do it. There's one other thing I want to point out, and I always get in trouble for doing this. But one of the reasons I'm here and one of the reasons we've been able to do what we've been able to do, I'll ask you if any of you remember an old Gary Morris song. I don't know whether you remember it or not, but the words something like this. Do you ever know you're my hero? Do you understand that I've always, you're all, I've always wanted to be? I could fly higher than an eagle if you are the wing, wind beneath my wings. There's the wind beneath my wings right there. My wife. She's put up with my foolishness for a long, long time. And I think this past Christmas was, what, 23 straight Christmases we were at drug court on Christmas morning and 23 straight Thanksgivings that we were there on Thanksgiving Day, and she's always been a supporter. I hope that all of you can join us for a few refreshments out in the hall, as I said, and my uh, great granddaughter down here has told me that it is time for me to shut up and let's get this thing over with. So thank you for coming. I'd like to see all of you in the hall. I appreciate all the kind words and thank all of you. conclude with a few re few comments by Judge Smith, who's had the privilege and the big boulder put on her shoulders by being the successor to Judge Norman. She's now carrying on the work. Good afternoon. It is truly an honor and a privilege to serve as the presiding judge for the Criminal Court Division 4 and for the Davidson County Drug Court, DC4. I knew when I stepped into this position that I was following in the footsteps of a visionary. And Judge Norman's initial vision for DC4 has withstood the test of time. After more than 20 years in operation, DC4 is still transforming lives, reuniting families, and healing communities. And it continues to expand, to evolve, and to improve through research and best practices. The program has graduated hundreds of individuals to date with over 200 since 2015. At capacity, the residential program saves the state of Tennessee $1.5 million per year by diverting convicted felons from the Department of Correction to into a treatment-based setting. DC4 now serves 15 counties, including Davidson County, and there are 63 residents currently on the facility at DC4, receiving the treatment to address the underlying root cause of criminal behavior and to stop the revolving door of recidivism. But even beyond those individual stories of the residents in treatment, the treatment provided at DC4 will impact the 110 children of those residents and the hundreds who came before who can look forward to a home free from active addiction. Criminal justice reform is a topic of the day. 
in legislatures across the country, and DC4 is a model of what that reform can look like. That is Judge Norman's legacy. It is a standard that will not soon be repeated, if ever, and that legacy will continue to shine bright in the lives of the residents, the children, and communities that benefit from the positive change offered at DC4. So I thank you, Judge Norman. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our ceremony this afternoon. As Judge Norman indicated, we invite you to join us at a reception outside. I'm gonna ask the court officers to escort Judge Norman to the reception area to receive guests. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon, and court is now adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.com. Thank you.